you. Taiwo Afalabi is an applied theater practitioner and researcher with a decade of experience working across a variety of creative and community contexts in over a dozen countries across four continents. His socially engaged practice deepens understanding of racism, identity, conflict, and social justice. He was the founding director of Theater Emissary, I hope I'm saying that right, International Nigeria, Prior to joining the University of Regina, Regina as an assistant professor, Taiwo served as the manager of community and artistic connections at the Belfry Theatre in Victoria, BC. And he holds a doctorate in applied theatre. And I am uh, particularly honored to uh, introduce Taiwo to you this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Wherever you are, good morning. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's an interesting feeling that I can hear you speak back. Can you just on me just say hi, hi, hi? <laughs> I know we don't want to disturb the technology. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hello. Hi, Taiwo. Great to see you. Oh, same here. Good morning. Hello, Taiwo. I said well, hello, but hello again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the generous introduction. Um, I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, and, and thank you everyone for attending this. Uh, it's 8.30 a.m. Uh, so it's pretty early for some of us and for some people it's 9.30, wherever you are. Um, I do acknowledge that you have many other things to do. So for you to be here today means that uh, it's a lot. So thank you. Um, what, what I'd like to do for us is really to acknowledge where I am now um, and, and the fact that um, I, I do believe that the earth, the earth is of the Lord, uh, but at the same time he's given the people that he's given custody or the custody has been given to. And at this point in time, I'm in Victoria, uh, BC, Canada, and the indigenous people, um, the, the Lakonga speaking people on whose land we are, uh, the Esquimalt West Saanich and whose historical relationship continues with the land today. I also acknowledge that um, as, as, uh, as an assistant professor at the University of Regina, that I, you know, that, that place it is situated on the Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 land uh, territories. And, and I'm not yet there physically, but I just want to connect with that because I think that is very, very, very important. And so, and again, I'm acknowledging wherever you are. Um, I know we're doing this virtually, but as long as the foot of your soul, uh, the soul of your foot touches the earth, you're, you're somewhere. So we, we really want to acknowledge that the sweat that has gone ahead, you know, the, the, the sacrifice that has been paid and all of that to be where we are today. So I really do want to acknowledge that. Before I go, in, go into my talk, I, I'm just, uh, the title of, you know, in the spirit of um, the, the monthly uh, theme, which is stress, uh, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and, and it's not going to be, I'm not going to talk for long because I'm just really going to open this for us to do a lot of talk back and forth. Uh, you can use the chat as we go forward. Um, but before I go into that, I would share my screen. I just want to ask you some couple of questions just to get our minds where we are and all of that. Um, so if I may, uh, if you have your phone with you uh, or you can use your computer too, we're just going to use a tool called Mentimeter. So you can go to minty.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And I'm going to type that on the chat in the chat box. And while I'm doing that, it says that it hosts disabled participants screen sharing. So would you just want to help me so that I can share my screen? Uh, menti.com. Uh, and once we do that, um, it's going to ask you to, um, it's going to ask you for a passcode. So, and I'm going to give that to you now. And I will type that again. Um, in our mail, in our chat box. Eight, six, three, four, three, five, seven. Um, Hi, well, were you able to screen share now? Uh, let me see. Yes, I can. Yes. Wonderful. Good. Um, so, once you put that in, um, the first question I want to ask is, um, uh, what, 
what word comes to mind when you hear stress? Thank you. And just keep 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 that word popping, um, and you'll be seeing all of that. Um, and, and while that is going on, I just want for anyone that need visual description of me. Um, right now, I'm, uh, of course, I'm I'm a black person uh, or brown. As you see, I'm wearing glasses, um, um, and I'm wearing a shirt, uh, 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 a blue shirt with a white stripe. I'm sitting on um, on a chair, uh, or you can see the chair, uh, and I have a background that's like office behind me. Um, my head is, um, I have a clean shave, so I don't have hair on my head, sort of just boiled everything out. Um, the background that I have is, um, it has uh, um, some touch of green, lot of, some leaves uh, behind me, and um, uh, a shelf, like a cabinet where I have uh, a clock and just a few books stacked up. Just, just to give you a general idea of, of, uh, of you know of what I look like in case you need a few visual description uh, of 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 me. Um, back to uh, the exercise that is going on. Uh, so, what word comes to mind when you hear the word stress? And I'm seeing pressure, anxiety, tension, homeless, migraine, uncertainty, problem. And the thing I love that is cool about this is that you see the and I know you can see that as as those words are popping up. Um, the words, the words that keep coming that um, that takes a lot of attention at the center, it means that that's the word that folks are writing a lot. So tension, anxiety, pressure. Um, I'll just give some couple of minutes for those that still want to pop any word. I'm seeing conscript, con, conscripted, weariness, tightness, unsettled, fear, pain in my body. I see excitement, that's interesting. I see heart problems. I see high stakes, time, volcano, energy. Um, I'm seeing, oh, um, uncertainty, caffeine, <laughs> uh, tired. Okay, um, great, thank you. Thank you, thank you for participating in that. I will move us again to the next question, um, uh, which is, how do you feel at this moment? At this moment in time, now that you've typed all of that, how do you feel at this moment? Now that you've been able to, well, you've not, you didn't verbalize it obviously, but at least you, you've typed something there. How do you feel at this moment? Because those words kind of speak to how you, you feel right now. I think it's just taking a moment to refresh. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, let me let me let me try that again. Uh, technology. Let's see. Can we see it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no. I see a message that says the question is not open for voting. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, let's, uh, what I'm going to do, um, it's just technology. I will just start the question to everybody here. Um, there is always an alternative. How do you feel at this moment? I just typed that to everyone. And let's just use that chart to just kind of do that. Um, well, we're always prepared as an artist. Things can go wrong, so always prepared. That's the model, right? Curious, okay. Happy, reflective, exhaustive, calm, uh, tired, intrigued, tired, stressed with technology. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel that. <laughs> Interested, rested, I like that. Um, exhausted, hmm, for st confused, frustrated with tech. Yeah, same here. Uh, content, well, great. Um, uh, intrigued and sleepy, thank you. I, I, I overwhelmed, thank you. I would just, I will leave it at that. And, um, and then again, if at any point in time you have questions or reflections or thoughts, please put it there. 
Um, the other thing I'd like us to do wherever you are is you don't have to stand up really. I don't need you to, I don't want to give you all of that stress to stand up, but I want to do something. And it's, it's part of what I do. If we're in the same space, I would want you to do this physically. It's to create a still image. And by still image, it means just create, think of what I'm going to, the prompt I'm going to give to you and think of a visual image that comes to you and capture that in a still image, like you would capture if you take a picture. So I know we can only see from our head to here for me, um, to my chest, I think. So when you hear the word stress, I want you to give me a, a, fish, a, a fissure expression in still image, if we can do that. Um, and that would mean that you pop up your, thank you. Thank you, Jen. I can see that popping up already. So just think of what do you think about, thank you, Shannon. I can see that already. It's like, oh, okay. All right. And, and you can just pop it up anywhere. Oh, thanks, Victoria. Oh, that's Matthew. Thank you. I see that. Oh, Finn, I see that. Okay. Great. Oh, Serena, I can see that. Jen, I see that again. Andre, I see that. Oh, uh, screaming. Okay. Oh, Catherine, I see that. Oh, Matthews, I see that too. Okay. Peter, I see that like you're thinking, really. Okay. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Ashta, I see that too. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I, I know it's, it's in the moment. I, you know, what I'd like to do today is really to, to share some stories and hopefully use that to provoke, you know, our, you know, our conversation. And, and, and I really want to, and, I, and I, the reason I started by asking the question, when you hear the word stress, what comes to your mind? Is that what I want to focus on today is not the feeling of stress, it's the thinking of stress. Um, and, and, you know, preparing for this talk, uh, I, it, it, you know, and I was reading a lot of literature, seeing a lot of um, videos and all of that and presentation about stress. It just kind of, you know, just kind of reminded me of, of getting a lot of you know, you know, nostalgia about some conversations that I had, that we had with my parents growing up. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of stories from from my upbringing um, and of course in my journey up to here. Uh, and the reason why I really wanna focus on the thinking of stress and by thinking of stress, what I mean is the mindset around stress rather than the feeling around stress or how you respond to it in a very reactionary way, but really the mindset that defines or determines how we think about stress each time we hear it. It is really for many reasons. One is, is that literature research has shown that the mindset around stress itself mean, determines how we feel about stress. The second thing too is because of my own personal experience growing up in Nigeria, uh, in a very you know, economically, politically, and culturally, it's a different climate. I think you know, I understand or my understanding of stress or how I was brought to look at stress, my mindset around it is somewhat, is somewhat you know, kind of interesting looking at it now. And the third thing for me, the reason why I had to choose this particular critical stance or this stance as it were, is really looking at history and how things have been over the years, over, over decades, uh, and how, you know, our race, our people have gone through different traumatic and vicarious stress trauma and where they are right now. So uh, with, with that being said, uh, you, I'm gonna read some couple of prompts here and there just to kind of serve as the basis of my, of, of my talk today. Now, I, I would wanna put out there that I'm not naive to, to the fact that when we talk about stress, there's a lot of psychological, neurological uh, understanding to it, but I'm just, I wanna look at it from a very, from a very social cultural perspective because I think that has its own um, piece to, to look at it. So I will, I will read some things quickly. Um, one is that there's, um, Nader Becker um, in a book that was published in, um, nine, in 2013 and the title of the book, uh, is um, the nation 
One Nation Under Stress, The Trouble with Stress as an Idea. They did, they, uh, Becca writes, and I quote, everyone is talking about stress from 1970 to 1980, 2,326 academic articles appeared with the word stress in the title. In the decade between 2000 and 2010, that number jumped to 21,750. Uh, Has life become 10 times more stressful or is it the stress concept that has grown exponentially over the past 40 years? That's the question that Becca posed. Heidi Na Hannah Wright, stress can be considered the stimulus experience or response that occurs when we need to adapt or change. Positive stim stimulation can cause negative results when we're not able to effectively adapt. A negative stimulation can cause positive results when we are. Therefore, stress might be best characterized as an energetic exchange, one that has the potential to lead to either growth or breakdown, depending on the internal and external environment in which it resides. Becca writes again. A national infatuation with the therapeutic culture has created a middle-class moral imperative to manage the tensions of daily life by turning inward, ignoring the social and political realities that underlie those tensions. So I think that we need to choose to have awareness, adjust our perception and build inadequate self-care care for others and reach at time, reach at time. And when you train your brain and body to effectively adapt to stress in a healthy way. When I was growing up, I, my, my parents and I, and I just to, uh, be, uh, to give you background, if I may, I'm, I originally I came from, uh, I come from Nigeria, 2015. That was when I got to Canada. Uh, but when I was growing up, I grew up in an environment in, if in Nigeria, a place called Ileife, Oshun State in Nigeria. Nigeria has over 180 million people in population, um, with 36 states, including, including the federal capital territory. Uh, there are over 250 tribes, ethnic groups in Nigeria. Um, there are over 400 languages, so it, it really, it's really huge, at least compared to Canada. It, it's really huge. Not in landmass, obviously, because uh, I think Canada has the second largest in the world after Russia. Um, but in terms of the population, it's really huge. And, and a lot of, because of the way the economics of, of things are in Nigeria, a lot of people, uh, you know, experience challenge growing up. So for me, that was not, an, for me too, right? that was not an, ex an exception. So I always say I grew up in a very humble background. By humble background, I mean, um, an environment where economically it's not what you wanted, right? Where and so we had to go to farm, you know, to you know, to fetch food. We had to hawk, you know, to sell stuff. Um, I went to school where you know we don't get our school fees paid on time like other kids, and you know many things like that. So economically, uh, you would say that we had things that could give us, you know, anxiety, right? Things that could, you know, give us. You know, in different ways, thinking about it, we're not like the same, you know, like other kids in community. But I remember there was this particular time when my father and my mother did call us. I come from a family of seven, five, uh, five, five siblings, plus my parents making seven. And, and, and they did tell us that we know that what you're passing through right now, I mean, you have no control about it, you know, over it, because you're, you know, it is what it is. And we didn't want you to pass through all of these things and all of that. But this is something that kind of, created this, this my, my perspective around looking at stress. Um, that what you make of this is really important and it's a question of your positionality. It's a question of where your, perspe your perspective, it's a question of, are you going to use these experiences to make you or to mar you? Uh, and at that point in time, you know, teenagers, we know we're like, yeah, you know, of course, we didn't really have that, you know, did he say that? And, and I'm really excited for my parents because they, they had this foresight that, you know, they will reiterate that over and over and over and over again. And also, of course, I come from uh, a faith background, 
Christian background, so we'll read the Bible, we'll have devotion and different things like that. And constantly encouraging us, like, don't worry about what is happening. You know, different things like uh, some would call it motivational and all of that. So at home, we had a situation that we had no control over, but we were given tools on ways to actually, even though we don't have control over it, we could actually use it for a, a good, whatever that is. But I leave the house and I moved to school and I realized that yes, even though I was a missed kid there, you know, that are coming from you know, affluent backgrounds, professors, you know, politicians and all of that, uh, I started seeing some couple of things that were, that I didn't have control over and it was so devastating. First of all, the teaching in my country, uh, the environment, I cannot speak my language as, as a Yoruba person. It's either, it's criminalized, it's either I am flogged or I have to pay money because the goal is that I have to learn to speak English. So I got back home and you know, I could speak in my language and all of that. And I started asking my parents, so I'm here in the house where there is a situation where I understand that it's not, there's nothing I can do about it, but thank you for giving me two to make it happen. But I get to school where, for example, language becomes a big thing where I can't, I don't have control about it. And there's really nothing I can do about it. I have to be conscripted to just saying whatever the way they want me to speak. Beyond that, I, because there was a huge level of inequality in, in that kind of setting, uh, there were a lot of, you know, arrogance from kids that their parents, you know, were ahead of us economically. Um, they come to school and, you know, I remember there was a day I was, I was we were walking to school and it was raining. And one man, one professor, he was really running because he was late for work and, and he just went through this pothole with a splash of water over a school uniform. And he couldn't even say, I am sorry. <laughs> he just like, oh, you know, and, and he left. And we were kind of fighting all of these realities, all right? Which I, I, there was nothing I could do about it, all right? But of course, I did finish and it was great. We left and all of that. But each time I come back home, each time I say this at home, each time my parents get to hear these things, they will just tell us, you know, just, just overlook that and just be focused, right? Move towards your goal and all of that. But little did I know that that was actually preparing me, preparing me for something more. So fast forward to 2015, when I got to Canada, it was the first time I knew that I was black, that, I, that this is me, that being like this means a lot. It, it, yes, I've had experiences before I came to Canada, but this Canada is the first place that I'm living, you know, in a very long time. It was here in Canada. The first time I realized that my accent really matters a lot, it was here in Canada. The first time I realized that that privilege that I saw a little bit of it in my own country, it actually played in a very mega realm here. It was Canada. Now, do I have power over that? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But here's, here, here's what I'm thinking. I started in this perspective that the positive mindset defines how I react to these things. Because it is, that, it is those experiences that either cause anxiety or they make me to, to be angry or to be fearful or to be afraid. Some of those words that, that we, we wrote this morning. But I come from a background where I am told that I should use those experiences. I should look at those experiences from a very positive perspective. And trust me, that was helpful. That was really, really helpful. Now I'll read something that can make, uh, and, I, and I want to be sure that I pronounce her name very well. When I was reading, when I was just preparing for my talk and I, and I saw this TED talk by Kelly uh, Megoni, Megonigal, and um, this, is what, this is what she writes. She said, how you think and how you act can transform your experience of stress. When you choose to view your stress response as helpful, 
you create the biology of courage. Uh, I'll read that again. How you think and how you act can transform your experience of stress. When you choose to view your stress response as helpful, then you create the biology of courage. And when I read that, I'm like, mm, I literally just put that, you know, I just you know, sent it to my, we have a family group chat on WhatsApp. I'm like, that's what my parents used to say. Wow, that's amazing, you know? And yes, it, it was helpful. I, I have to admit that, you know, it, it built this level of resilience. And for those that are familiar with literature and resilience and all of that, when you go to a continent like Africa or to a country like Nigeria, you see all of these things that I've described and you see how people are thriving despite that. You would see what we consider stress in this part of the world or distressful in this part of the world, we, we, we find a way to scale through them. We find a way to look at them differently. We find a way to, to look away from them. As an artist uh, with my own company back in Nigeria, we create peace, you know, state performances based on these things so that we can have a different outlook and all of that. And we have these, this positive outlook that you'd be like, oh my God, you guys are great, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, scholars in resilient studies and resilient literatures says that we've sort of built these, these, these huge fence of positivity, of positive outlook to be able to look at some of those negative connotations differently. And of course, research over the years has shown how that is important and all of that. And, I, and that's why I'm starting from there. I do really want to recognize that. But what I want to flip over is the second part of, of my story, which is what about that situation, the circumstances that as much as I try to be positive, is still gonna create anxiety. As much as I try to give it a positive outlook to build resilience around it, there's nothing I can do. I just want us to think about that just for a minute because that is the next part of my talk. As someone coming from a different background, coming understanding what is happening right now in the cultural ethos of the world. Of course, we're having this conversation within, you know, a global pandemic, which has sort of caved every one of us in, boxed us in, and, and with, you know, we're challenging, you know, uncharted paths now. Or do we want to think about all the issues here in, in Canada with indigenous population, with the indigenous and you know, black and people of color? Or is it just the recent Jake Black that was killed in the US just a few days ago? There's still the same thing happening over and over and over again. Then how do we come up with a positive mindset to look at stress? When you start living in an environment where how you look really matters a lot, the people you know is important, your accent becomes a defining parameter for you, the spelling and the pronunciation of your name becomes an important thing, it becomes the identifier of diversity, equity, and inclusion, where your stories does not really matter, where your race is insignificant, where your past is continually being challenged or not even being recognized or not even deemed fit to be listened to, how? This is very important for me and I'm just gonna spend more, you know, just a few more minutes to, to really dwell on this. Because it's at this point that I'm twisting that the head of stress on the other way around now. Um, you know, it, it, it is important to be appreciative of where we are right now, and I do acknowledge that. But at the same time, it is important that how do I defend myself from that feeling? 
the thinking about stress is something that I cannot do about. I can think about it differently. I can be insulted because of how I look or, you know, be gaslighted, whatever. But I can, I can, I have the capacity to, to rethink it and redefine it. But I'm coming back to a society, a culture where it's constantly been perpetrated. And that's why the vicarious trauma is inherent. I have the capacity to positively think about it. When I say I, I'm not just talking about myself alone. Many people, many generations, many cultures, many bodies, that their realities is constantly similar or shared history of discrimination, of injustice. They have the capacity to give it a different outlook. That's why they will try as much as possible to do twice, three times more than a typical, you know, student in the classroom, because that's what our parents tell us. We, you have to thrive to be better because we're giving you all that we can give you so that you can be, get to a better place. But I can process all of that. But when I come back to a particular environment, culture, where each time I give it a positive outlook, what comes back to me is the negative thing again. So I'm not, I'm not looking at stress from a, from a neurological medical perspective. I'm looking at it from a very social justice perspective because that's what my work is all about. And I think that these are very critical questions that we need to start thinking in terms of systemic, systemic change that we're all talking about. I think that the present moment at this point in time has given us and is constantly presenting us with opportunities for us to rethink what we're doing or even why we're doing what we're doing. I think the moment in time at this point, and I would love to, I, 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 I would love to, you know, to con I constantly love to listen to, you know, forefathers of civil rights movement and they've talked extensively about the need for change, the need for us to, to come together, the need for a race to be identified, to be recognized, the need for a change, for there to be a total turn around. But the reality is that we're still stuck up in that culture where it is full of stress. So I think about stress from a very pragmatic standpoint, from a culture where I have to be resilient. And so when someone was asking me this morning, I was talking about a talk I'm going to talk, uh, gonna say, and, and, and I was chatting with, with, with my wife, and she said, well, so where do you find more stress? Was it in Nigeria or was it here? And I said, well, that brings me to the second part of my talk, which is the feeling of stress. I find it more stressful here. And that's why I decided to start where I'm coming from. It was stressful economically, it was stressful politically, it was stressful thinking about everything. But I saw people around me, I was built to be resilient. But I come here, and if I'm not careful, all of that resilience is just, it just plugged down into the drain. Why? because I'm in a culture that stifles me. So it is stressful here. It is the emotion and the psychological pattern of stress here. It's just so way too much that I wanna think about the, 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 the positive stimulation, but I can't negate the negative stimulation. I see the mix of those energies all coming together because that's the reality. I can't leave the other, for the other, I have to bring both of them together because I cannot survive if I just think about the possible angle to it without bringing about the negative, the negative stimulation. Kelly continues. The Kelly McGoniga, uh, the TED talk that I told you about and it's titled, How to Make Stress Your Friend. So, and when you choose to connect with others, under stress, you can create resilience. How you think and how you act can transform your experience of, of stress. When you choose to view your stress response as helpful, you can create the biology of courage. And when you choose to connect with others under stress, you can create resilience. And, and each time, and that's why 
That's why there's a lot of protest. That's why there's a lot of march because there is that yearning to connect to people of like minds. People who perhaps, have, maybe they don't have the shared memory or shared experience, but at least they've been able to build a considerable compassion and empathy. So how does all of this plays into my work as an artist? And, and, I, and I, have, I, I have, my goal is that I want to finish this by 9.30 so that at least we have 30 minutes for, for question and answer. How this plays into my work as an artist is the reality that I, I constantly want to go into community to be able to use my art to create together. I started my theater company back in Nigeria, it's called Theater Ministry International. I started in 2012, and we've been able to work across different spaces, working on socially engaged, uh, social issues that are important to Nigeria. But I thought I was leaving theater ministry, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to Canada, that's fine. You know, you know what I hear, what I read on the news is, is, is really not what it is here. But I realized that I got here and all of a sudden, it's just the same. So in the past four, five years that I've been here, I've been able to work with you know, newly arrived um, youth, immigrants, uh, refugees, international students. Uh, I've been able to work with indigenous communities. And recently, I'm now working with you know, artists and cultural administrators that identify as indigenous, black, and people of color. Because I believe that if we need change, we want change, it has to start with us as artists. I use my art to create different projects. And I'll just cite one example of the project I've been able to create over the years. And then I'm happy that Serena is here because we were, we, she was part of that project. In 2017, um, myself and, and another person, community planner, her name is Jasmine Rajawander, we started this project we call Onion Theater Project. And the goal was to create a space for refugees and newly arrived immigrants to share their stories. We really understand that where they are coming from, which is which in many ramifications we, we have we are coming from, where they're coming from, we share we might share some things in common. Uh, because the other thing I, 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 I have not mentioned is the fact that I, I used to live in Jos, and if you've heard of Boko Haram and Jos crisis and all the post, all the conflict and and all of that, I I I, 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 I had my own share of that. So coming from a from a post-conflict zone, as we would refer to it, uh, and unfortunately, some of that is still happening, you know, right there in Jos and some other part of, you know, some other part of the country. Um, I was able to connect to a lot of met some of the refugees that are coming from, you know, war, war, war torn places and, and post-conflict zones, and and we wanted to create a space for them to tell their stories. We wanted to, for them to create a, wanted to create a space where not just telling their story where they're coming from, but tell the story as it is here. Because there are many times that we think that this, you know, Canada or the, you know, global, you know, the global South and, and sorry, global North and, you know, Europe and, and North America, that everything is fancy, is beautiful. And we don't tell the story the way it is. So we wanted to create that space. And so we worked with refugees or newly arrived, arrived um, youths in, in Victoria uh, with some international students and at some point we were able to work with uh, indigenous um, youth to create a story around what does it mean to arrive in a new place? What does it mean to become? What does it mean to belong? Do you even belong at all? How do you want to be heard? How do you want to be listened to? And of course we devised that over, over three to I think three to four months um, and of course we presented that on World Refugee Day in 2017 and 2018. And over the course of the lifespan of that project, I think we, we, we didn't do it, we brought it to an end last year. We performed for over 800 people across 10 different places in Victoria, both the city hall of Victoria, uh, in a, a, a district of Saanich, uh, in uh, University of Victoria, in Claremont Secondary School. Uh, we went through all the spaces that we could lay our hands on to share that story. With the fact that People might be coming from a perspective, especially a lot of immigrants might be coming from a perspective where you need to have a positive outlook to life. You need to build resilience. And yes, of course, we do build it. Trust me, we build it. And you can see, you have success, success stories of a lot of immigrants all over the place. But when we get here, some of those things that we build resistance to, when we get here, 
we need to start from the scratch. I didn't know that my color matters when I was in Nigeria. Yes, I understand that there is tribalism and ethnic, you know, ethnic, a lot of ethnic groups in Nigeria and all of that. But we still treat ourselves as, as we look the same, where, you know, we, we are who we are. But when I got here, I realized that, you know, Tawu, you're, you're so different. I was the only one in my class that looked like this. And that meant that even in pedagogy, that meant that even in writing, nobody really understood me. I became the gaze, as it will be called. So the social realities of what makes it stressful even here becomes so apparent. Of course, I did scale through and I provided opportunities that were offered to me to, you know, to create the little change that I can. I created classes to teach about African theater. You know, I worked at the Belfry, brought people together and all of that. But how much more change can I myself make? How much change can I make when the reality is that we're still constantly coming back to that same social, cultural, economic, status quo that makes it stressful. So I didn't want to start my conversation today by telling you to take a deep breath and stretch yourself and all of that, because trust me, I'm gonna, I do that every day, but I'm gonna come back to that reality that provokes that constantly. So that's why I started by saying that, how do you feel about stress? And how do you think about stress? because there are two different realities, but they all come together at the end of the day. One informs the other. I'm happy to create a biology of courage as Megoniga called it. I'm happy to create a system where we can build resilience, but for how long when a particular culture, a system really, continually takes you back to square one. And it's on that note that I will open up questions uh, comments, um, thoughts, if you have a game or exercise, let's put that in and we open that and, and we have good, you know, 40 minutes now to do this so that I don't, I didn't just keep talking to myself. But I, I do hope that I've been able to kind of give you a, like an expose on, on where I'm coming at this conversation so that we can all be able to engage uh, in, uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes or so in a very fruitful conversation. Thank you. I open up the floor for, for conversation now. Uh, yes, Matthew. I was applauding you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, thanks for your words, Taiwo. And I, 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 I guess while I have a moment, I, what you're saying about, um, this is my son, Monroe. Um, what, he's a good example for me of um, not much stress. Um, it, when you, what you were saying at, at, at a couple of points reminded me of an article I read recently in Rolling Stone by Wade Davis. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. I'll, um, I'll paste it in the chat. Um, but uh, basically he's talking about um, you know, uh, and he, he's uh, speaking about Amer America. If you if you don't know who Wade Davis is, he's uh, in a chair at the University of Victoria. He's an anthropologist. Um, he's very eloquent speaker, uh, um, and he's speaking in this article about um, the fact that um, uh, America, and I think it's you know Canada as well, but the the focus on the individual by the by Western um, society, and that that sort of permeates a lot of his work. How that. Um, has led to a kind of unraveling. And for, for me, that was really connected by some of the things you were saying. And I just wondered, can you speak to the difference between, um, is, what is the focus like in Nigeria on the individual versus the, the greater, uh, the larger society? Uh, that, thanks, Matthew. Uh, I would say that in uh, Nigeria, the, or to a large extent, the African culture, not, not, not to be, uh, to box everybody into one now, but I think we shared some similar, you know, we, we shared some similar exam, um, similar similarities in our culture. It, 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 it is 
meant to be or it used to be very communal and we still have some cultures and some places that that's still evident but the reality is that with the advent of you know, colonialism and now we're talking about globalization and your new colonial practices i think it's really getting individualistic to be honest with you is that um so you, you can get to a place where you see you see a mix of them uh so i won't say it's just this and that Things that things are really changing, and that for me, that what is um, what what um, disheartening for me, <laughs> to be honest, because I think there's a lot of there's a lot of power in maintaining that culture of that communal culture, um, but but you know when when the the devil in the room, you know, or as we say it, um, uh, um, when economy and and you know capitalism start coming into play. It start splitting us apart, and and I and I think that that's what is happening right now. Uh, in my own particular example, um, I was brought up in a very communal space, um, very respectful place. Um, as, as just my examples uh, from my parents and, and 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 my you know my siblings, we it's it's very we're brought up together to understand one another. Or even if when we don't understand, ready to listen to one another, don't shut off the conversation. Um, and, and things like that. And I think for me, I did, I, that was a way for me to build that resilience I was talking about. Um, but then when I left that, right? I mean, I'm still connected obviously, but when I left that tradition and I come here and I realized that the focus is really on that individual. And as I'm saying, what can I do? It's, it should shift. I think that there needs to be a shift from that individual and we need to balance it and, and bring that culture here. I'm sure if I answer your question. Um, Hopefully, I did speak to your question. Uh, and the other thing to speak to in terms of reference and all of that, um, articles and all that, is that um, I, I deliberately decided not to um, to 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 um, to to dive into a lot of literature because I'm of I'm of opinion, and this is my opinion, um, is that we need to start decolonizing um, curriculum and the academia and in presentation we need to start hearing quoting other people that are not you know that we don't hardly hear about uh, even if that's not um even if that's not within the mainstream and so that's why a lot of my talk and a lot of my work I, I try and moving forward that's something i've tried to tell myself now is that i i will i will moving forward i really want to start finding ways to bring voices that we've not heard um to the mix and, and thank you for raising that article because I think it's a very powerful article and kind of connected to what Dana Becker I was talking about one nation it's really the context of America obviously but uh, we know that when we talk about America there's a share of that idea that I think are very that we, that we can actually see you know some of them here in our culture so thank you Marty for raising that I can see some chats happening and you know some words um thoughts in the chat already um uh, 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 yeah, the comment on the article um, uh, by Wadi Davis, a great article. Um, there's a link to uh, Creative Morning Talk by Wadi uh, Davis. So if anybody's interested, for sure, please uh, go there and, and listen to that. Um, uh, thank you for the question uh, by Catherine. Uh, and I'll read it out to everybody so I respond to it. I found talk to be governizing and I'm interested in conversation around how to move forward to change things. How to resist the urge to place the burden of change on one individual, uh, decolonizing the classroom and inner institutional systems. Um, uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Catherine. And I would say that um, uh, I think that we need to move towards that now. And how do we want to do that? Um, I'm just, uh, I would say that the reality is that there can be, there can be. Um, a change to that until we change our epistemology, our outlook to life. I think that there's a heavy, there's a heavy, you know, a heavy, um, um, there's a heavy, uh, 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 how do I say now? We have, we put so much on the individual, um, which I think that we need to start moving things around. So I'll give an example. I, I thought it cost some couple of months ago and in my, Cause I try to bring a lot of group work as part of my task for the class, and I and literally ninety percent of my of my students did tell me that 
that's a new way of working for them. And many of them were in year three, year four. Um, and so I was asking them, so you did, you did year one, you did year two, you did year three, now you're in year four. You've not done a group work like this. Uh, and they said that, um, yeah, that, you know, you know we, each person wants to have their voice and all of that. And that even if they give them group work, the way they do it is that each person will go on their own to write or to do something, then they bring it together. And I said, no, that's not, that's not what group work means to me, where I'm coming from. And that was very shocking. So I think that to be specific in terms of decolonizing the classroom, I think that the pedagogy needs to change, the epistemology needs to change. The system needs to, needs to look at things differently. Um, the curriculum needs to change, or maybe not change, but at least need to be revised. Those are concrete things. Um, uh, uh, that's, that's the other thing. The other thing in terms of even the system itself is that, uh, you see, I don't want to be the only burden, the only person in, on that committee that each time you talk about EDI, I'm the one you look at too. And, and, and sorry, Catherine, I'm not speaking to you now. I'm just, I'm talking generally. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't want to be, I, I want to be in a committee where all of us were concerned it, it becomes a collective. You see, if it's me that you want to, we want representation on that committee and you, we want me to be on that committee, if we just leave it at that level, it's still individualistic. But when we start, when the, the reason why I'm brought on that committee or anybody that look, that look different anyway, bro, is brought to that committee, if that reason become a shared reason, then it shifts, it shifts the attention from me to all of us. And for me, that's what I find very, um, very stressful, is that I get on a committee. The reason why I get on that committee is because I am representing a minority or a marginalized community. So when a conversation around something like that comes up, everybody just say, yeah, no, let's, no, and what do you think? And I'm like, oh, well, this is what I think, but I want all of, I want it to become a shared body, all right? Because it's the, it's the burden of carrying that entire piece that is stressful for me, if I'm using the, you know, to use the term stressful again. Uh, but if we make it a shared responsibility, that it becomes a part of our shared value. And I think that with that, we start sh shifting, you know, the composition of board, we start shifting composition of our practices, policies, so that it becomes an integral part of it. Because even when I, and I'm brought on a board, for example, or a meeting or a committee and all of that, or I'm in a classroom, or I'm given opportunity to do something. If it's not shared, if, if, if others don't share that same burden with me, I might think that it's even still very tokenistic. But when we all share it, at least when I see that sense of commitment and we can do it together, then things that start sh shifting. The other thing in terms, specifically in terms of classroom and the academia, specific, you know, you know, specifically, is I think we need, to, we need to shift who we're quoting and who we are referencing. You know, that's why right now I'm happy to, to, to quote my parents, to quote a grandparent or somebody or something that I hear from someone. Though, even though it's not within the mainstream of what we could call academic scholarship, that it's still acceptable, it's still fine. You know, because whatever they say that is written down, that Rutledge like published, for example, is still the same thing. It's still valid. You know, in my work email, at the end, I wrote that, and this is what my parents told me when I was growing up. He who asks the way from someone that knows will find the way only if the person is a deep listener. And, and I, I cherish that each time. And of course, my mom also says that if you're traveling, that he who asks for the way will not miss the way. You see, and each time, so in my work email, for example, I have that at the end. I'm not quoting Aristotle, I'm not quoting anybody. I'm quoting them because that's valid for me. I think we need to start entertaining and embracing new forms of knowledge, new forms of knowledge production, new methodologies, new pedagogy, new curriculum, new voices. I think that's the way to decolonize it, to use our academic term. That's the way to look at things differently. And, and trust me, I can speak more on this because uh, uh, Catherine just asked a question, uh, a subject that is very dear to my heart, but I will stop at that. I hope I did speak to your question anyway. Um, 
Okay, um, okay, no question. Uh, and again, maybe not question, maybe it's just, com uh, it's just comments or things that you may have, ideas, perspectives, something that you've read. Please, by all means, I don't want to keep talking to myself. Carol, okay, well, I want to share one thing with you that came up for me when you were talking um, that took me back a really long time ago to a book that I read um, called The Continuum Concept. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if anybody's read this book before. It was written in the 70s, and a friend of mine gave it to me when I was pregnant with my daughter. Um, and it's interesting because when I first read it, you know, I thought that she was giving me a book that was full of like parenting advice. <laughs> um, but actually, what I took away from this book was some really interesting stories that the, the author shared um, about her experiences uh, traveling with these two. I, if I recall, it's been a long time since I read it. She was traveling with two Italian researchers who were um, in a really remote indigenous area in South America. And she was um, sitting back sort of as, as this unusual suspect in all of this uh, experience as a, first of all, as a woman in the seventies having that experience. Um, and she talks about, um, uh, this one particular story of them um, where they were uh, traveling a really long distance by foot uh, carrying this really heavy metal um, boat that they were going to launch into a river in order to get back to a major city to, to, to leave um, the, the, the jungle I guess that they were in and um, everyone's legs were just getting torn to shreds and everyone was just um, uh, experiencing a lot of physical pain and this trying to move this really heavy thing and it was the the two Italian men that she was with and then a group of indigenous um, people from the village that they had been in. And they were all experiencing this turmoil together and decided to stop and take a break. And she um, sat up on a ledge and was just sort of observing down this group of people. And the Italian men were just furious and they were swearing and they were mad and they were just oh, so frustrated with this experience. And then she looked at the group of indigenous men and they were laughing and smiling and making fun of each other and having this kind of joyful experience. And this story in the book becomes sort of a, a launching point for her to talk about this um, perspective and how important perspective is in um, a, a situation becoming stressful or to just sort of um, share this um, this turmoil and pain together as a community and, and find joy in it, even though it's hard and difficult. And that particular story really resonated with me when I read that book and it, it kind of stuck with me for many years, yeah. this idea of how important, um, how important our perspective is and, and just taking that time to really think about, is this situation or this stress something that I'm gonna let overtake me or am I gonna repurpose it into something that um, is useful to me as I move forward in life or on this project or whatever this thing is. Um, so a lot of what you were talking about really reminded me of that. And it's, it's definitely very useful to be reminded of those things as you're sort of moving through your time. So thank you so much for that. Uh, thank, thank you, Adrian. Uh, and I, and I think, and, and I think maybe I mentioned this to you before. I think that many times what we consider stressful here, yeah. I just laugh. Like goodness, it's not stressful. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. uh, <laughs> because it's very subjective, right? Yeah, yeah depending yeah. on where you are in the world and absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks for your thoughts. Um, why? Hopefully, um, we can still share thoughts. These are. So uh, Victoria wrote, and I'm reading that now, the social ideal here, Canada, seems to be to achieve aloneness, own car, own house, and, 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 and you know, stress-free. <laughs> um, and, 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 I, and, I, and I do agree. Um, and, and I think that, and, and this might be something that, you know, I, you know, at some point, you know, hopefully I can look into it, that's why anybody be interested. There's a lot of cooperative ideas now um, that folks are really looking around that I think might be a model to look around some of these things. Because I think for me, and again, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in these at all. I think that, I think that capitalism really thrives on, long, on, on, on individuality. Um, so imagine all of us, we have, um, we, ha we own a house together. Um, one one big place then that means that you know we pay we pay one mortgage and all of that you know the profit will not be the same as if we all own separately or own cards you know and all of that or the the you know the car pooling you know venture and all of that i think that, that's that that might be other ways to you know reimagine our community um 
and this is not just uh, Canada, I have to be honest with you, even back in Nigeria specifically, we're beginning to imbibe this you know, culture in the Western world because it's been preached to us or it's been presented to us as if that's the ideal. So even for us to really need to imagine that. I see um, Alison's hand up there. So um, I'll just, allow Alison, please go ahead. Thank you, Taiwo. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I thought, oops, oh dear. I am not, I'm, I was with a headset with no microphone. So I had to unplug the headset. And when I did that, everything crashed. Sorry for that. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, Taiwo, you've spoken very eloquently this morning, and uh, you've said just about everything that needs to be said. And I'm very grateful that in your, in your conversation, and you did bring up um, economic injustice and uh, the effects of capitalism and how capitalism thrives on the success of the individual at the expense of those who perhaps are not quite as committed to their individuality, shall we say. That's a, maybe a polite way of saying that. Um, right now in Victoria, we have a very serious situation with homelessness and housing. And as you know, you and I met face-to-face uh, um, -face, uh, as a result of me wanting to, to activate the artistic community, in particular the theatre community and people engaged in applied theatre, to, to come out and develop some work around our current housing crisis. We have a situation where people's lives are being stolen by developers. I have, in response to the pandemic and my inability to develop the transformational theater project as I had envisioned it, I've created a not-for-profit society for housing called Network of Homes Affordable Housing Society. I've sent you a link uh, in the chat and I okay. can post that for the group. And something that we want to do is create a community story piece. And I'm bringing that now because you talked about how much, how important it is to work as a community. That we need to set aside sometimes our individual goals to address the needs of the community. Yes, uh, Alison, if I may, yes, absolutely. And, and I think that um, it, personally for me, um, wherever I am today, I, I, it, I don't think it's a product of just me alone and everybody can speak to that. And so I think that there is a need for us to come together as a community to address what is needed to be addressed. And I'm going to say that while we do that, we should not lose the sight of who we are as an individual. I think this, this is where, you know, it's the paradox, right? We need to bring all of that together. So I really appreciate your, the venture that you started, the, the, the not-for-profit that you started. And of course, I, I acknowledge um, the work that you're doing in community. And I, and I believe that everybody, you know, many of us present here, we, we are in many ways reimagining and trying to find around how do we answer this question? What can we do? Not that what can I do, but what can we do? Or even in the midst of the what can mm -hmm. I start that others can join? So it's, it's, it, I think it's, 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 re, it's really, um, it's, it's yeah. really valid. And, and I really acknowledge that. I have a quick comment, Tyrell. Uh, yes, Shannon. Good Her to name. see you. Good to see you too. We're new colleagues. Um, <laughs> um, uh, it, was, it was sort of piggybacking off of what Victoria was talking about and um, about how, yes, there we, there's this, sort of pressure to achieve aloneness, to own this and own, um, but there's also seems to be a, a quite a culture of wearing stress as a badge of honor. And um, I know in my 
community as a mother, um, you know, um, with other parents is always talking about how busy we are and how tired we are and all the stuff we have to do and how, and it's, I mean, obviously it's a good stress relief to talk about it, but there's always seems to be this culture of one upping um, who's the most stressed and, you know, to, to achieve some level of the stress content. Uh, yeah, it's, it is. It, and um, just wondering if anyone else, you know, feels that kind of pressure, especially coming, I also just finished my PhD, like uh, Taiwo, and there's that culture in academia too, to always be stressing out. It was all about how stressed you are and, you know, how to, to get this next uh, paper out there and finished. Thanks, Shannon. And I, and I think that, um, and this, this, this is not even academia, even as an artist and all of that. Um, one thing that I find really interesting is because we're in a culture of production, we have to keep producing. And that's for me as an artist is like, if I don't, if I rely on what I did last year for this year, and I'm not thinking of a new project this year, my goodness. I, <laughs> I, it, so I think that it's that culture of production. And I'm not saying production necessarily is a bad thing. No, not that's not what I'm saying. But I think that we need to rethink that. Or uh, that even some of the things we call production that we do not, we, you know, for example, the act of caring for others, that in itself is a production, but maybe not in the sense of how we define it in a capitalist society. Um, but trust me, once we take that act of care given for someone and we bring it into the mainstream, then we brand it as, you know, caregiving and all of that. It becomes means of money. As long as it is not um, something that gives money or something that gives us prestige and all of that, it's, it's, it becomes problematic. And so then for me, what I'm thinking, and constantly we always talk about this in my own family, is that we only need to reevaluate our value system because the value and the virtue system. So it's not just the value, you know, the virtue system, both, both goes together, both go together. The value and the virtue system needs to be re-examined. Individually, we need to do that. Collectively, we need to do that. Because if I'm not careful, Shannon, the reality is that I might get up into that whole idea of I have to keep producing, 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 producing. But in 2019, last year, the reason why we stopped oriented our project was because we were, we were at the, in the middle of wanting to create. And three, four out of the cast, things did not work out. Someone had to go home, someone had to do that and all of that. And we told ourselves, you know what? I think we need to stop here. We need to take care of everyone. And so myself and, and Jasmindra, that we co-created this project together, we, you know, we just spoke to everyone, you know what? Right now, I think our sanity is important. You are doing something that is important. That you need to take care of yourself. So we're not going to do that project. And do you know that since last year up to this year, we're not doing, we've not done that project. So even as an artist, now I need to start telling myself, at what point do I need to, you know, reevaluate my virtue and my value system? Because that production and production is something very key. <laughs>